we're going to be talking about uh, ways that we can measure the variability or the spread of a set of data. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the various measures of variation or measures of variability. And that includes finding the range of a distribution of quantitative data, finding and interpreting the interquartile range, and calculating and interpreting the standard deviation. So the vocab includes range, interquartile range, quartile, and standard deviation. All right, so um, we call that in the other lessons, we talked about you know the various shapes of distributions. And in actually the previous lesson, we talked about how to find the center or the measure of center. So keep in mind that two distributions can have the same shape and center, but still look quite different. So here, um, here's an example of how that looks like. So the parallel dot plots below show the scores of two bowlers, Earl and Kelly, in their most recent games. So Earl's at the top and Kelly's at the bottom. So notice that both distributions are symmetric and single peaked with centers around 150. So their center, you know, their middle is about 150 for their bowling score on average. Uh, and they both have the same shape essentially. However, they look very different because uh, the variability is different. So if you look at the spread of Earl's scores, they're very spread out um, with a score below 50 uh, for the lowest score and then a score in the 250s for the highest score. So what this is telling us is that Kelly is a more consistent bowler than Earl because her distribution of scores is much less variable or it's much less spread out. So she, she uh, tends to be more consistent in her throws, either consistently around the same area. Uh, so there are a couple different ways that we can measure distribution, uh, the variability of a distribution. One of, them, one of which is the actual range, which is the simplest measure. But there is the range, there's the interquartile range, and there's the standard deviation. So as mentioned earlier, the simplest measure is the range. So if you want to define the range, it's the distance between the minimum value and the maximum value. So if we want to put it in a formula format, it's just range equals maximum minus minimum. So obviously the most simple measure of variability. So let's look at an example real quick of how to calculate the range. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, below are the travel times in the minutes of 20 randomly chosen New York workers along with a dot plot. Find the range of the distribution. So normally the data is not going to be sorted in order. Um, but that's fine. All you're looking for is the maximum and the minimum. So the maximum here is 85 and the minimum is 5. So then the range is simply the difference between those two values and so our range is 80. So this seems to be quite spread out. So a range of 80 means the data is, uh, that measure of variability is very high and the reason why the measure of variability is high is because there are outliers in the data set. If there are outliers, this actually changes the range quite a bit. So the range is not a resistant measure of variability as it depends on only the maximum and the minimum values. So if we want something that is more reliable for a measure of variability, we're gonna use the interquartile range. So to avoid the impact of outliers, we can focus on the middle of the distribution because the middle doesn't tend to change when you're dealing with outliers. So to do this, we order the values from smallest to largest, and then we find what we call quartiles. The quartiles are data points or values that divide the distribution into four groups, and these four groups are about the same size. Quartiles sounds like quarters, right? So there's four quarters. Um, in the same way, there are, quartile, there are four quartiles in a set of data. So the second quartile is the median, which we already talked about the median, the median is the middle number in the data set. In the same way, the second quartile is the middle number in the data, in the data set, so it's halfway up the list. The interquartile range is found by using the first and the third quartiles. So we're going to talk about how to find the first and the third quartiles. So to define them, the quartiles of a distribution divide the data set into four groups having roughly the same number of values. To find the quartiles, you need to arrange the data values from smallest to largest and then find the median, which is called the second quartile. The first quartile is the median of the data values to the left of the median. So once you find the median, you essentially just focus on the left part of the median and then find the median of that data set, and that would be your first quartile. 
Once you find the median, then you can look at the data values to the right of it and find the second quartile by cutting that data in half. We'll see how this looks like. So um, this should actually say uh, third quartile and not uh, first quartile. So we'll make that correction. All right, so we went ahead and made the correction. So it should say third quartile or Q sub three. So how do, how do these two uh, quartiles and um, look like in general? So looking at this data set, so we have the amount collected each hour by a charity at a local store. So we have a dot plot of the results. So notice that the second quartile or the median cuts the data directly in half. So if you look at to the left of that median, there are one, two, three, four, five, six dots. To the right of the median, there are one, two, three, four, five, six dots as well. So we cut the data uh, into two equal um, pieces where there are six data points to the left, six data points to the right. All right, so then next what you wanna do uh, so now that we know there are equal numbers here, six and six, that uh, median or second quartile, now we can find the first quartile. So looking at these six numbers, you wanna cut them in half, which is over here. So now there are three numbers to the left, three numbers to the right. So essentially, you're trying to find the median of the left part of the data, which is the first quartile. And then for the third quartile, you're trying to find the median of the right part the right half of the distribution, which is the third quartile. Notice that there are three data sets to the left of the third quartile and three to the right of the third quartile. So once we are able to find these quartiles, <clears throat> then what we can do is we can find the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is the distance between the first and the third quartiles. So in symbols, you're just taking the difference between Q3 and Q1. So the interquartile range is given here. So it's the distance between the first and the third. So you subtract that to get the distance. The interquartile range measures the variability in the middle of the distribution. So notice that we're looking at the middle part of the distribution, but we're still looking at the spread so that these guys don't impact the middle distribution as much. So if we have outliers, they won't impact the variation as much in the middle. So therefore, this, this tends to be more reliable and more resistant to outliers. So let's look at an example. Here again are the data on the amount of fat in grams in nine different McDonald's fish and chicken sandwiches. So we got the data given below. Find the interquartile range. Interpret this value in context. So the first thing we want to do is we want to sort the data from smallest to largest to make it easier for us because we want to find the median. So clearly, if you, um, if you work your way towards the middle, 19 is the middle number. So that's the second quartile or the median. Now notice that it splits the data into the left and the right halves, and each half has four numbers, four data values. Now, if you wanna find the first quartile, you're gonna work your way towards the middle. So if you note that there, there's actually two middle numbers here, um, so that means we're going to take the average between those two numbers, so 14 plus 16, then divided by 2, and that gives us a first quartile of 15. So now right here is my first quartile, and it's given by 15. All right, so then for the right half, we work our way towards the middle, and so it looks like we have two middle numbers, so the third quartile, you're going to average those two numbers together, and we get 24.5. So then if we split the data in half, that part, then that would be our third quartile, which is 24.5. Now that we got the values, uh, we can actually go ahead and calculate the interquartile uh, range. So if we calculate the interquartile range, that's just Q1, Q3 minus Q1, which is gonna be 9.5. So if we wanna interpret this, uh, this means that the range of the middle half, so this part right here, the middle half of fat content values for these um, sandwiches is 9.5 grams. So as we mentioned earlier, the quartiles and the interquartile range are resistant because they are not affected by extreme values or outliers because we're dealing with the middle of the distribution rather than the edges. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the standard deviation. So remember that the interquartile range measures the variability about the median or the second quartile, which is like the middle half of the distribution. 
and should only be used when the median is the measure of center in that distribution. Uh, the standard deviation, on the other hand, can be used to describe the variation of the data values around the mean as opposed to the median. And it should be used when the mean is reported as the center of center, as the measure of center in the distribution. So if we look at the definition of standard deviation, the standard deviation measures a typical distance of the values in a distribution from the mean. To find the standard deviation, we use S or SX. If of a quantitative data set with n values, we need to do the following things. We need to find the mean of the distribution first because the standard deviation is trying to measure the distance from that mean. Then we need to calculate what we call the deviation. The deviation is simply the distance from the value to the mean. So we take the value, the data value, minus the mean. So for example, if the mean is 5 and we have a data value way over here and it's the data value is 12, right? then the distance between 12 and 5 is 7, so the deviation there is 7, assuming that this is the mean, x bar. So for step 3, once you get that deviation, in our case the deviation is 7, we're going to square that deviation. So we're going to square each of the deviations, so in this case we would do 7 squared, which is going to be 49, and then we would add each of the deviations, then divide by n minus 1 and take the square root. So for example, if we had another number to the left of the mean, let's say the number 3, then the deviation from 5 to 3 is going to be um, negative 2 because it's the value minus the mean. So 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Then you're going to square it in step 3. And then you're going to add these two deviations together. So you're going to add up all the deviations, take the square root. So here's the formula given below. So, um, so again, we have the square root, and then we have the data value, take away the mean, and then squared. So notice that we're doing we're squaring. So each of these here, each of these here are the deviations. So we'll use DEV for short, and we're adding up all the deviations uh, together from the mean, and then squaring them, of course. And then we're going to do the square root at the very end. So remember that this symbol means that you're adding the you're adding stuff together. So this means you're adding. So you're adding up all of these deviations, uh, all of these squared deviations, and then dividing it by n minus one. N n is the sample size, so that's how big your sample is. How many numbers do you have? How many observations? And then taking the square root. So it's better to show you you know how this looks like, uh, in an example. But for now, just know that this is the formula. The SX is the sample standard deviation symbol. Remember, the sample is smaller than a population. So if you have an entire population that you're studying, you're just taking a, a subset of that population, a smaller portion of it. If you were to find the entire population, then we use the Greek letter sigma. This is the lowercase sigma as opposed to the uppercase sigma right here. So, so the arrow that I pointed to is the uppercase sigma. Uh, this right here is the lowercase sigma. And it's used when we're, do, when we're doing the standard deviation for the entire population. All right, so let's show you an example of how this looks like. So uh, nine children were asked how many pets they had. Here are their responses arranged from lowest to highest along with a dot plot of the data. So we want to calculate the standard deviation and then interpret it. So first off, we want to find the mean of this data set. So in order to find the mean, we're going to use the mean formula, which is just simply adding up the numbers, dividing, it, dividing by how many uh, observations we have. So if we add up all the numbers, we get 45. Then divide that by 9 observations, we get 5. So the next thing we want to do is we want to set up a 3-column table for the standard deviation. This will help simplify our calculations. So first column is the value. So this is just the data. So I went ahead and listed the data. Uh, from smallest to largest. Uh, it does not have to be ordered from smallest to largest, but it just makes it easier if it's that way. So now we got all the data values on the table. Next thing we want to do is calculate the deviations. So the deviation is calculated by the value minus the mean. So we're going to take each of these. So this is going to be the second column here. So we're going to take one, this first number, and then minus it by the mean. So the mean we said here was 5. So 1 minus 5 is going to be negative 4. 
All right, next we're going to do uh, four, my, the next observation is three, then take away the mean of five and we get negative two. And we repeat this process to get all of the deviations. Next we want to do the square deviation. So we're gonna square each of these uh, deviations in column two. So that's over here in this third column. So we're squaring the deviations that we got here to get uh, the to get the square. So negative two squared is four, negative one squared is one, and so on. All right, so then next we want to add up all the square deviations. So we wanna add all these guys, all these guys together. When we do that, we get uh, 52. And that's uh, given by this arrow. So now we're gonna use the standard deviation formula, which was given earlier. Uh, so this part right here is actually the sum, which was actually given here, which we were finding earlier. So when we add up the third column, we plug it into the numerator. And then remember that n was given by nine, because we had nine observations. And then we take the square root at the very end and we get 2.55 pets. So basically what this means is that the number of pets typically varies by about 2.55 pets from the typical value of five pets. All right, so what are the properties of the standard deviation? So a couple of things that you gotta know about the standard deviation. It is always greater than or equal to zero. So it's never gonna be negative. And the reason is because you're squaring all these observations. And, and when you square a number, you're never gonna get um, a negative number. You're always gonna get a positive number or zero. It is only equal to zero when there is no variability. So basically, like if you had all of the data values being three, then in that case, the average is gonna be three However, uh, when you calculate the standard deviation, S, we're gonna get zero because if you were to do the deviations, data value minus mean, you're gonna get zero for the deviations. And then if you square it, you're still gonna get zero. So when you do the standard deviation of a data set that is uniform, this is a uniform data set, you're always gonna get uh, a value of zero. Notice that larger values indicate greater variation. So if you have a value of zero, that means no variation. Uh, a value greater than zero indicates that there is some type of variation. The standard deviation is not a resistant uh, measure of variation because it is very sensitive to extreme values. So if I had outliers, it would definitely mess with the calculations and definitely increase or decrease um, the variability depending on the outlier. So generally speaking, if you have outliers, it's gonna actually increase the variability um, because outliers are extreme numbers. So if every time you have an extreme number, you're generally gonna increase the standard deviation and make it larger. Um, remember that it measures variation about the mean and the mean is influenced by outliers and therefore the standard deviation is influenced by outliers. So the standard deviation should only be used when the mean is chosen as the measure of center. So let's talk about choosing the measure center and variability and just kind of recap. The mean and the IQR, which we, we talked about earlier, are usually better than the mean and standard deviation when you're talking about skewed distributions or distributions with outliers. Uh, the reason being that the mean and standard deviation are influenced by outliers and therefore should not really be chosen as the measures uh, for that data set. Whereas the median and IQR are not and easily influenced by those outliers. All right, go ahead and pause the video and try the problem first. All right, so we got the number of public school teacher strikes in Pennsylvania for a random sample of school years is shown below. So first off, we wanna find the range of the distribution. All right, so remember that the range is the maximum minus the minimum. In this case, the maximum number is 14, the minimum number is three, so we simply take the difference and we get 11. Now, if we wanna find the interquartile range, we wanna sort the data from smallest to largest, as shown below. So uh, when we sort it, remember that we wanna find the median first, so we wanna work our way towards the middle. So that's over here. So we can cut the data in half, just like this, but in order to do that, we got two middle numbers here, which are eight and nine. So we gotta take the average of those two numbers. So eight plus nine divided by two 
is going to be 8.5. So now we got our median or our second quartile. Now we got to um, split that we know that we can split the number, the data into two halves on the left side and the right side, each of them having three values each. Now we can worry about finding the median of the left side, which in this case is just that one middle number, which is seven. So the first quartile is seven. Now we need to find the median of the right half of the data, which in this case is 10. So that's our third quartile. Now we simply take the difference between the third and the first quartile to find the IQR. So Q3 minus Q1, so 10 minus seven, which is three. All right, next we want to calculate the standard deviation and interpret this value in context. So we want to set up a column, a column like a table with three columns, uh, one with the value, the deviation, and the square deviation. So we're going to go ahead and list out those numbers down here. So um, those are the numbers listed below. And what we want to do is we want to do the average of the data set. So we're going to do the average first out of the numbers, divide by six because we got six data sets here six data values and we get a, a mean of 8.5 next we want to do the deviations so we want to take each data value and subtract it by the mean so remember that this is this is our data value and then the 8.5 is the mean so data value minus mean gives us deviation and we repeat this for each of the data values all right, so now that we get the deviations, what you have to do is square those deviations. So you're gonna take each of these guys and then you're gonna square them in order to get um, the square deviations. And you're gonna repeat this for all of, um, all of the data values in the column. Next, you're gonna add up the, de the square deviations together. So you're gonna add up this entire column together. And when you do that, you get 65.5. So this is the symbol for sum. Remember that the sigma means that you're adding things together. So you're adding all the squared deviations together here. So let's go ahead and rewrite the formula for the standard deviation, which is the sum of the squared deviations divided by the total number of data sets take away one. So in this case, this is our total number of, uh, our total for the squared deviations. So we're gonna plug that in for the numerator and we know that we have six data values, so six take away one, and then take the square root to get 3.62. All right, to summarize the data, uh, to summarize the lesson, we talked about ways to uh, measure variability in data, and those three measures include range, interquartile range, and standard deviation. We also mentioned that the range is the difference between the maximum and the minimum observations and that the range is impacted by outliers and does is not a resistant measure of variation. Now the quartiles split the data into four groups of roughly equal size. The median is technically called the second quartile. Now to find the interquartile range, this is the measure of variation about the median, but to find it, you need to do the difference between the third and the first quartiles. Now the interquartile range and median are useful for skewed distributions. Um, and to find the standard deviation, we measure the variation about the mean. So basically to do this, we take the square root of the deviations squared and then add them together, divide by one less than the sample size. Now the standard deviation and mean are reported for roughly symmetric distributions, whereas as we mentioned earlier, the interquartile range and median are reported for skewed distributions. All right, next up, we're going to talk about summarizing quantitative data by the use of box plots, as well as how we determine mathematically what an outlier is.